spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of the Scaryish Podcast. Woo! I'm Robin Grace, and this is Adam Diaz, and uh, we're here to chat together, I guess, about interesting topics. Indeed, we are pretty excited for this episode. We're finally out of skeptical August, uh, so I can just go back to the normal stuff, and uh, I found something pretty interesting, and I'm really excited for it. Robin, what are you going to be covering this week? Um, I'm going to be covering Charlie No Face. Charlie No Face, right yep. on. I've never heard of this before, like today. So because you're a hoe face. Thank you. That was really mean. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be covering the Empress Hotel, uh, which I started out investigating on the paranormal end, and then realized there was definitely some real stuff that happened there, and it wound up taking a little bit of a true crime twist. Uh, so it all oh, like informs each other, and I'm really excited about that. Uh, before we get started, a couple of things I wanted to address. Uh, first and foremost, if you send us your stories, we appreciate you. They are going to get read. We do those on the Storytime episodes that release every Friday, and we also record those episodes live, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, every Wednesday at twitch.tv slash scaryishpodcast and youtube.com slash scaryish. Come on out, watch us record it. It's really, really fun. If you have a story of anything, uh, whatever the homegrown horror you've experienced is, Robin, what are the sorts of things that we look for? Our homegrown horrors can consist of paranormal, supernatural incidences that you've experienced, your family have experienced, your friends have experienced, that you've got stories from. Uh, we've had really funny coincidental ones. Um, Those ones are honestly my favorite because it's like, I really thought I was being haunted by a demon, but it turns out it was absolutely nothing. Yeah. Uh, those are really funny, and I think we can all relate to those I, for sure. It just reminds me of that one video where the guy's down in the basement and his sisters are playing with a Ouija board upstairs or something, and, and he, he turns, turns off, off the, the switch. Yeah. God, it's so funny. <laughs> you just hear the screaming of the little girls. <laughs> and he starts turning it on and off and on and off, and it's just shrieking, that sort of thing. And if you want to send us your story, please email storytime at scarish.com or go to our website, scarish.com, and click on Contact Us. Fill out that form. It comes directly to us. Or you can reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find all of those on our scarish.com website. Or go to at Scarish Pod for Twitter, at Scarish Podcast for Instagram, and Facebook.com slash Scarish Podcast. Fun stuff. That's the normal. We are running a giveaway right now. The only thing you need to do to enter into it is to share the episode, whatever form of social media that you see it on, share it. And then in the comments of the official release, just uh, tag a friend and let them know, hey, you should listen to this. We already have quite a few entries from a lot of people who have done it for like every single episode, yeah. which is amazing. And it's just going to be basically a box of goodies. So a bunch of stuff that Robin has curated. It's kind of a preview of uh, what you would get if you're on our goodies tier on Patreon. And we also want to give a shout out to these amazing patrons that we have. Connor, Bernadette, and Michael. You guys are awesome. And... We just want to give you guys that shout out. Yeah, they're at the shout out tier, which we appreciate. Thank you so much for the donations. It means the world to us. I'm going to be able to actually buy the studio a new computer for everything that we do soon. And it is in no short part thanks to the donations we've received from all of you wonderful spooky friends. So thank you so much. Uh, that said, I think we're able to get right down into the spooky stuff now. So I believe you are going first this week, correct? Yeah. So someone posted in our Facebook group about this topic. And this week, I think it was our friend Mike who posted in the, the Facebook group. I believe it was. And it's the legend, but also a true story of Charlie No Face, also known as the Green Man, but really called Raymond Robinson. Wow, that's a lot of names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the legend of Charlie No Face changes a bit depending on who's actually telling the story, but it generally revolves around Pennsylvania. That's interesting because you're telling the story now, so you can just make up whatever you want. And this will be Robin's version of Charlie No Face. So, so any place that I grew up never had a story of this type of character. Uh, but apparently in Pennsylvania, it's a really big thing, which isn't surprising because the person is from Pennsylvania. So uh, some stories also take place in Ohio, but I'm assuming the borders are close. So it's I, I'm very not good at geography. Yes, this is showing. Yeah. Yeah, so. I believe they do touch. So. Okay. So uh, it's some stories take place in Ohio, but it mostly takes place in Pennsylvania. And it's always something when people are telling the story, it's always something where so and so heard the story from someone else or like my dad saw this or my boyfriend saw this and they told me this Um Things like that. It's always a secondhand account. It's never like, right. I saw this thing happen. But I was reading a whole bunch of different interviews and things like that where it was my dad. My dad actually hung out with this dude or something like that. You know what I mean? Stop teasing us, Robin. Get yeah. to the story. I can tell you that uh, Indiana, Northwest Indiana, Chicagoland area didn't have anything similar to this. 
that I know of. We ha- we mostly had stories of like the chicken fucker. I don't know if you remember what? when that happened. There's an episode about the chicken fucker no. of South Park where oh. they made fun of it. They called it the chicken lover. That's from Valparaiso, Indiana. So no way, one hundred percent true. Not even joking around about it. I am mind blown. Yeah, once uh, that's we start, disturbing. Once we start leaning into the true crime stuff, and I start doing like my homegrown, I don't know, murder stuff. It'll be like, so here's this story about this guy who had sex with chickens. That is so weird. It's gross, yeah. All right. So the legend tells of a man, and depending on where the story is originating from, this man is described in different ways. Some say he was burned alive or struck by lightning, having his face melt like candle wax. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Have you ever uh, watched that movie? House of Wax. House of Wax. No, I have not. That kind of disturbs me. Because there, I think there is a scene where someone's face melts. Or, or am I mixing it up with Indiana Jones? I don't know. I mean, that's definitely a scene in Indiana <laughs> Jones. <laughs> that's haunting. Uh, okay. Others say he was green because of radiation from an accident at the Duchesne power plant. He's even been described as a wandering spirit doomed to haunt the highways of Pennsylvania, chasing anyone he comes across. It's a bummer. It's a lonely <laughs> so, existence right there. Yeah. There's even a specific tunnel that's been abandoned since 1962 called the Piney Fork Tunnel, and that's been labeled by locals as the Green Man Tunnel. Uh, Teenagers would drive into it and turn off their lights and then call out to the Green Man who would appear to them. And this story... If he appears to them, how do they see it if their lights are off? Is he glowing? He's like a glowing green man. So he's like Mr. Burns in that episode where the town thinks they're the aliens. You know so much about Simpsons. The Simpsons episode where it's a crossover with X-Files because they think it's an alien and it turns out it's just Mr. Burns glowing from radiation. Wow. Uh, This story claims his green tinge is the result of an electrical accident. Accident, and that if he touches your car, his electric charge will stall your car or make it difficult to start again. So maybe if you push your dead car into this tunnel, he can give you a jump, and you can be like, "Yo, dog, <laughs> thanks for that shit. I appreciate it." That'd be it. amazing. Uh, I guess at the same time, you could kind of consider this as a cautionary tale. So climbing things and not looking out for dangers, stuff like that. Uh, Lonely Island teaches me that YOLO means you ought to look out. You ought to look out. (laughs) Uh, Parents would also tell their kids things like, if you stay out too late, you might run into Charlie No-Face and he'll take your face to replace where his once was. Right on. That's pretty scary. I think a lot of these local legends wind up being the result of parents being full of shit and trying to scare their kids into not doing something they don't want them to do. Yeah, but this one actually turned out to be true. I mean, not not the whole he's going to take your face thing, but... I was like, this guy never has a dead car battery? What? No, shut up. Uh, the main gist of the story goes something like this, where a boy named Charlie was climbing an electric pole to try and see a bird's nest up there, and he accidentally got tangled up in the power lines and was e- electrocuted. And he fell to the ground where his friends surrounding him just began screaming. And Charlie's face was melted beyond recognition. Good God. He lost his eyes, nose, mouth, and an ear, and even one of his arms. And he was even tinted green. (laughs) So that's the main gist of how the legend kind of goes. And... Charlie survived his injuries, but would come to realize life would never be the same as it once was. And whenever he stepped outside, people would scream and even faint at the sight of him. So he lived a life of hiding, staying in abandoned houses, foraging for food, and walking the highways at night. And all he wanted was a normal life. Why would you walk the highways at night? Like, I get that he's, like, alone and all that stuff, but, like... There's better ways to get around than walking on the highway. Like, I get going at nights because you're worried about people seeing you, but, like, take surface streets, Charlie. It's just an urban legend. Okay. Teenagers would drive along highways to try and encounter Charlie No-Face. Lots of people actually reported talking to him, though, and even taking pictures with him. And you'd think they were making something like that up, but in actuality, Charlie did exist. But his name was Raymond Robinson, and apparently he was an all-around pretty chill dude. Did this, uh, all that stuff actually happen to him, or were the results of his injuries different well, let's go from a different into source? It. Okay, yeah, tell us. Robinson was born October 29th, 1910. So what are the odds of him being born during spooky season? <laughs> Like, he became his own scary urban legend. I hope for the sake of those, I don't know, present right now, (laughs) that being born during spooky season doesn't mean you're, like, more inclined to have a horrific accident befall you so you can become a spooky legend. I just ended up starting a scaryish podcast. You did indeed. Good for you. 
Uh, well, two cheers for Robin. Oh, thanks. So he lived to the ripe old age of seventy-four. So he lived a pretty good life. That is I mean, good. I mean, not pretty good. I, let pretty me, long. Let me it just. It could have been really let me fucking miserable there. that whole time. Let me backtrack here. So he lived a pretty long life. He grew up like most kids do until a fateful day, uh, June eighteenth, nineteen nineteen, and the story of the boy wanting to see the birds was partly true. On his way home with his sister and a few friends, he was dared to do it. So was it a double dog dare or a triple dog? I think dare? his friends were like, no one would be brave enough to go climb that pole or something like that. He you got know no balls. I mean? No balls. It's when you say something, you're like, no balls. You got no balls. Oh my gosh. And it's like you challenging someone to do See, it. See, girls no don't balls. do that. <laughs> you guys don't have no boobs? <laughs> That's so stupid. Okay. When he was nine, he climbed a pole to reach for a bird's nest on the Murado Bridge outside of Beaver Falls. And the bridge housed the Harmony Trolley that carried electrical lines of 1,200 volts and 22,000 volts. Oh, God. Uh, I got that from the internet, so I don't know if that's right, but... Robinson, Someone's out there taking the voltage readings right, right now. Right, Robinson was electrocuted either way, and he was thrown from the cables by the force of the shock. And I'm totally picturing Jurassic Park oh, when they yeah. flip on the fucking fences and that kid goes Do flying. Do they ever show the voltage on the the that fence? I don't remember. It might have said fifty thousand volts. Like no I think way. the sign says how many volts it is. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Now it makes me want to go back and watch Jurassic, Jurassic Park, Park. Continuity people, please let us know. Yeah. The same lines had killed another boy less than a year prior. So another kid had died and they still, I don't know, left the cables there for kids to touch. But I guess kids shouldn't be climbing poles to touch them anyway. Yeah, they're like, hey, guys, this is a trolley that exists. You're going to need to avoid touching the things that will kill you. Please don't be dumb. Right. Despite doctors at Providence Hospital not expecting to, Robinson survived but was severely injured and disfigured. Uh, he lost his eyes, nose, and right arm at the elbow due to the incident. Uh, so that's a, that's a lot of things to lose all at once. Um, there were articles written in the newspapers about his ordeal, about how doctors were absolutely mind blown by how he survived. Uh, the kid that had died prior only was in the hospital for two weeks before he died. And 10,000 volts. I just Googled it. Oh, my God. Jurassic Park, that fence was 10,000 volts. And so she should have been practically melted. He. It's the he. Okay. Well, he should have been screwed by that fence. There's no way he would have survived 10,000 volts. I mean, it's a movie about fucking dinosaurs. (laughs) So (laughs) dinosaurs coming back to life. As likely as that might seem now. uh, Yeah, you're right. That that continuity seems a bit messed up. But hey, lots of shit happened in that movie. Yeah, dinosaurs. Yeah. Aren't scientists trying to bring dinosaurs back now anyway? Yeah, that's why I said it's realistic as it might seem now. I'm pretty sure Jurassic Park's going to exist in China in like the next 10 years. That's insane. You got to wait for them to grow up and everything. It's like they've never seen Jurassic Park. I think they've seen it. I think they just watch it and they're like, if we do this right, imagine the power (laughs) or the money. More like the money. I still haven't seen the new Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Yeah. I haven't seen it either, so. Uh, I'm scared to watch Chris Pratt die. That, I'm pretty sure me. he doesn't die. Anyway, so, doctors, mind blown. This guy survived. He left the hospital within a few weeks of the whole him getting shocked by 22,000 volts. That's insane. That's 2.2 Jurassic Park fences. That's fucking nuts. <laughs> 2.2 Jurassic Park <laughs> Tim would not have been oh okay. That's God. all I'm saying. Oh, my gosh. His, the kid's name is Tim. I'm pretty sure the kid's name I is Tim. I don't remember any of the character names. I'm going TVH. back to Google. You keep going. My friend Rothman absolutely loves Jurassic Park, and he'd be so ashamed That's because he right has now. wonderful taste, because that's an amazing movie, and a Michael Crichton book, by the way. Uh, understandably, Robinson spent his life keeping to himself, rarely going out during the day, and he lived with his mother, Lulu, and family in Koppel, and made doormats, wallets, and belts, which I think is pretty cool considering his injuries. That takes skills. I don't even think I could put a belt together for a cosplay, let alone make them to sell to people. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, his and- name was Tim, by the way, confirmed. Oh my gosh, stop Googling stuff. <laughs> anyway, he was a big baseball fan and listened to games he could pick up on the radio. He also learned how to read Braille. He couldn't stand being cooped up, though, so he took to walking at night, getting some fresh air when he could. He felt his way around with a walking stick and kept one foot on the pavement and one foot on the gravel. 
so he could tell where he was. Where he was. That's smart. Uh, he'd walk through. You know, that's why they put gravel on the warning track, or dirt on the warning track in baseball parks. Is because like when the outfielders are retreating, it lets them know like you're about to hit the fucking wall, so they can <laughs> slow down. Because before they had the warning track, like people didn't know, outfielders didn't know, and they would just slam into the walls and hurt themselves. I'm trying to to put in my mind's eye a catch I've seen recently where they've run into the wall, and I can't even picture that track you're talking about. It's like I think it's I think it's regulation like five feet before the wall. You have to have a patch of dirt so that the person will notice that all of a sudden the ground has changed to a different surface. Huh. So it's the same principle that this guy used to make sure he was still on the side of the road. Interesting. So he'd walk along the state route 351 in Pennsylvania, and it does go through some rural areas. So I could totally see a legend growing from that in and of itself, like some um, guy walking at night along the highway through these rural areas, I can just see people going, well, that's creepy. Yeah, it would be creepy to see someone walk. I mean, like we just recently took that detour we talked about last episode through the middle of Imagine nowhere. Imagine seeing someone walking along yeah. there. Oh, I mean, especially man. Especially someone that was like, that had massive injuries like that, where you'd be like, oh my God, like, is that person okay? Or is it a ghost? Or should we keep driving, you know? Go, 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 go. <laughs> I hate you. Uh, so he traveled between Koppel and New Galilee. And... People would gather in hopes of trying to run into him. So they would go in groups, fill cars up with people. Probably something you did when you were younger. Fill cars up and just go places. So it's like they were were trying to catch him like a Pokemon. Oh my god. Uh, Some went to try to see him out of sheer curiosity. And then some just did it because they were horrible, horrible people. So Robinson would usually hide from curious neighbors but would sometimes exchange photos and conversation for cigarettes. So if people wanted to take a picture of him, he'd be like, yeah, g- give me some, some cigs. Uh, some people would bring him beer, um, but they'd bring him like beer and a straw. <laughs> wow. Uh, to, so it's just imagine this dude sitting in the back of your car and you're just chilling out with this dude, smoking some cigs, and he's just holding a bottle of beer with this straw sticking out. It's just, I think it's cute. I anyway. think it's cute too. Uh, anyway, Though he was beat up a few times and struck by cars on more than one occasion. It's fucked up, dude. Uh, Robinson just kept on trekking on. He kept on walking them highways. Did he keep on creeping on? Yeah, he kept on creeping I on. I feel like you were avoiding it. Uh, everyone has a vice, I think. So his was cigarettes and beer. So he would stop when people were like, yeah, here's some cigarettes, here's some beer. And they would do horrible things to him. It I was feel awful. like he knew, uh, he lived, I should say, he lived in a time where people didn't know yet that cigarettes were bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when the doctors would be smoking while they were giving you your diagnosis for what was wrong with you. Oh my God. Because like everyone smoked back then. Because you said he was born in 1910, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he definitely lived through the era where it's like no one knew everyone was smoking and then they're all like, oh, this is what's killing us. That's a bummer. Yeah, um, I just know everyone has their vices. Like our friend had changed her fantasy football team to will trade for puppies. Wow, I didn't realize puppies uh, can be a vice, but I guess if you get too many of them. I'm, I love puppies. I think my vice would be Disneyland and Amazon. So it's like, oh, come here, I got Amazon credit for you. Or like, I will want agree. some cheap Disneyland tickets? I will agree with both those statements. That's how you lure Robin into a white <laughs> gross van is just to have that sign on the side of it. <laughs> Yeah, no. Seriously, though, when different websites are like, here, we're, we'll give you $5 in Amazon credit if you do this survey or something like that. You know what I mean? I'm like, ugh. Robinson went on these walks until his last years of life. So he started walking less and less until the 1980s. Uh, wow. he, he retired to the Beaver County Geriatric Center, where he passed away on June 11th, 1985, at 74. So he lived... To be 74. That's a long time. Especially after suffering such a crazy accident. Like a horrific injury. Yeah. He was buried in Beaver Falls and in the Grandview Cemetery, just a short distance from the scene of his accident. He's buried next to his father. Robert Little, the other boy who was killed by the bridge before Robinson, is also buried there. Wow. Yeah. I think it's unfortunate that the story of his urban legend is kind of spread out more than his actual story. Uh, So I'm really glad that Meadows posted in the group because I had never heard of it before. No one really knows where the concept of the green skin thing came from. Uh, Some say it's because he always wore his favorite green plaid shirt. 
That's probably what it uh, was. Or yeah. green clothes in general, and, and the green kind of reflected onto his skin. Others say his skin was so pale that it had a hint of green to it. <laughs> but uh, I think it's really neat that this story is a thing, that it came from a real person. It's really sad, his actual story, but I'm really glad that Meadows posted it and kind of let us know. I really want to know why people say he's the green man. <laughs> I want to know if people still or, see him now that he's passed away, though. People still try to find him. P- people still try to see if they can run into him, uh, which I think is cool because that's the whole urban legend aspect of it. And people right. are still telling his story. But I just, it's really neat. Raymond Robinson wasn't anything but chill. So he was really nice when people wanted to come by and chat over a smoke. Uh, there are totally a whole bunch of pictures of him on the internet so we'll have them on our instagram yep. obviously so we'll have them on our instagram um there's pictures of him hanging out with different groups of people and it looks like they're having fun in the pictures like the teenagers that are around him they're all like smiling and stuff like that um they're not surprisingly all at night they're all like dark pictures where it's just the flash that you see the people on um those that have met him say he was very kind and one of the nicest people that you could meet It's said that his walks even caused traffic jams during the 1960s because people gathered to meet him. That's kind of nice. Yeah. As long as they weren't assholes about it. Well, there are people that were assholes about it. I'm sure there are, but like, I I just imagine that he had good days and he had bad days, and hopefully he had more good days than Yeah. Some say that, especially after local football games, police had to start giving out tickets to anyone who was stopped on the road because they would just cause these traffic jams. Uh, his disfigurement may have scared most people away, but those that stuck around and got to meet him literally got to meet an urban legend. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. A uh, random thing that I came across while researching this whole thing was a newspaper from the area using the term goose flesh to describe their skin instead of goosebumps oh, wow. or chicken skin. So chicken skin, um, goosebumps, goose, goose flesh. flesh. <laughs> That's fucking gross. So, yeah, they were trying to describe how people reacted to seeing him and things like that. And they're just <laughs> like, yeah, they got goose flesh. I'm covered in bird what bumps. The- <laughs> bird bumps? <laughs> Hashtag bird oh bumps. Oh, my God. Okay. Post scary shit on the internet. I don't even care if it's about scary Oh, my but God. But I want you to hashtag it with bird bumps. <laughs> and I'm going to search that hashtag this week and see oh how many of you have done it. Oh, my God. That's so ridiculous. Okay. But, yeah, that is the story of Raymond Robinson, also known as Charlie No Face. Right on. That's really good. I had no idea this person actually existed. I had never heard about that urban legend. I know a lot of our listeners out in the Pennsylvania, Ohio region are going to be like, oh my God, I didn't even know that. Or they totally did. And this was just like a re-education for them. So good stuff, Robin. Thanks. All right. So this week I actually wanted to cover a haunted location. I mentioned to Robin, I kind of wanted to cover a haunted house. And while following that path, I wound up at another hotel actually. And although there's definitely plenty of supernatural reportings from within the walls of the hotel I am covering, there's also a pretty crazy story about its most famous ghost. So without further ado, I present to you the Empress Hotel. So like many of the hotels that we discuss, I think the first question that people want answered is, where is it? Uh, So I'm going to answer that and the second one that people usually want answered, which is, can I still book a room there? Because let's be real, most of our listeners just want to expose themselves to scary, spooky happenings. So before we get into any of the legends, I'm going to let you know the hotel is actually in Victoria, British Columbia, which is in Canada, for those of you who don't know, or Canada, for those of you who say it incorrectly. (laughs) It is also known... Some people say it Canadian? Yes, some people do. Shut up. No, they don't. Yeah, They say it as a joke. Oh, 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 okay. The hotel is also known as the Fairmont Empress, uh, which... I mentioned because it is still available to book rooms at, and you can find rooms for about $250 a night. That's expensive. It is, because it's really fucking nice. Like, I was clicking through, and I'm going to get to it a little bit later. But Are like, we staying there soon? I would If we go to Victoria, we're totally fucking staying at this place. Like, I am down. It is pricey, but like I said, it is gorgeous. And so now that you know that, I'm going to give you the story of the Empress Hotel And then you can decide after the story if you still want to check this place out yourself or if you're going to avoid it at all costs. And what's funny is when I wrote that, I was thinking folks would be creeped out by the story and change their minds, but immediately realize that if I tell a super creepy story, our listeners will just want to go book a room even more. So, like, uh, you're welcome, Empress Hotel, for all this free advertising. It's pretty impressive. That wasn't bad. Okay, I'll give you that one. (laughs) So this hotel officially opened for business on January 20th, 
1908. Wow. So it predates Charlie No Face. Suck it, Robin's topic. By uh, two years. <laughs> You're such a douche. Two nozzle. years, 10 months. Uh, so this place actually started being built in 1904, but it was not completed until 1908. So that's like four years worth of construction. And even for a very large hotel, which it is, that's a long time. Uh, Francis Rattenberry, the architecture of the Empress, was pretty well known at the time, and he was also kind of an asshole. Which is going to play uh, in. I think a lot of architects are assholes. Are they? Well, I don't know. Ted Mosby is. Ted Mosby definitely is an asshole. So just <laughs> picture Ted Mosby when I talk about Francis Rattenberry. Uh, his friends actually called him Rats. R-A-T-Z. That was his nickname, which isn't, in my opinion, a good nickname. That's like not something you would want someone to call you, but apparently that's what he went with. Teddy Westside. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, if I had a friend and I called him Rats, it wouldn't be because I liked him, is basically what I'm oh, saying. Oh, I see. Okay. So, uh, anyways, Rats designed the hotel and took his sweet ass time doing it. And every time anyone would bring up how long things were taking, he would blame them. Like, he would even blame them in the press. He would immediately call them out saying that it was somehow their fault. Wow. So, this started in 1904. By 1906, the schedule of the construction of the Empress Hotel was already behind by 14 months. So they're way off. So they're like not going to meet Worse their than deadline. The Raider Stadium. It, yeah, right? The Raider Stadium is nothing compared to this. Uh, but if you were that far behind on a major project at your job, like what would you do? Like if it was me, I'd probably try and get this shit done. Some folks out there would make up excuses for why it's not done or why it's not on track to be done. But Rats did neither of those. Rats actually took to the press and announced he was working on another hotel with the rival company <laughs> to uh, Canada Pacific Railroad. What? So Canada Pacific Railroad owned this corporation. There was like a division of them, I should say, called uh, Canadian Pacific Hotels. Is that allowed? Are you allowed to work for the competition like that? Not normally. Not anymore. You usually have like clauses in your contract that state that you can't do that. And sometimes it's even for like a while after you've stopped working with them. But he just like puts it out there like, yeah, I'm working on this hotel uh, with the rival to the company I'm currently making the Empress with. And like what's interesting is like you hear that shit and you think like, how do people get away with that? Like he must have been the boss, but he wasn't a guy named William Sutherland Maxwell was, which as a side note, that is this amazing old timey name that I absolutely love. William Sutherland Maxwell. He sounds like, like a villain. <laughs> he's not, though. He's not the villain in this story. And in that announcement that Rats made, he even said it would be nicer than the Empress Hotel, which he was still currently That's involved in building. Fudged up. Yeah, and slowing down. So uh, William Sutherland Maxwell was pretty friggin' annoyed. And he and Rats would butt heads a lot. And eventually they did finally get to building this hotel. And Rats and William did have a huge disagreement over interior decor on the project in November of 1907. Now, keep in mind, this thing launches January 20th of 1908. So they're like two and a half, three months away from this launching. Were you going to say, is it light bulbs? Yes! I knew you were going to say that because I almost put that as a bullet point because that's what Teddy Westside was all worried about. Yeah, he's like, these light bulbs are going to be in all these places on every floor. These light bulbs are going to define me. Oh my goodness. So basically this is what happened. So Teddy Westside or Rats and (laughs) William aren't getting along over the interior decor three and a half months, two and a half months before this hotel finally opens up after everyone's been waiting for the shit for four years. And Rats goes to the company and he says like, yo dogs, like I am the architect here. Either you do what I say or you can find another architect. So he gives them this ultimatum like it's me or this guy you fucking pick. And on December 5th, 1907, they announced that they had accepted Ratz's resignation. Wow. So that whole ultimatum thing totally backfired on him. And I don't think they even let him know that they were, like, taking his resignation. They just announced it like, he quit. Like, he fucking straight up quit. Because he kind of did. Like, people do this shit all the time when it comes to, like, that high level of, like, sociopath nature and like a lot of power within a company like it's me or nothing or it's me or them like you always give this ultimatum where it's like you have to fire one of us you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like you see it in a lot of movies it's kind of a cliche and it, it came from somewhere so they basically say okay you're gone and william takes over as chief architect and shocker the hotel opened a little over a month and a half after they made this announcement wow rats was so 
pissed about how this whole thing went down, he refused to attend the opening. He is still listed as the architect of this hotel. What? Side note, he's the architect of the parliament building in British Columbia. It is fucking gorgeous. So, like, I say that he was, like, kind of in the public eye. It's because he was this, like, very well-known, very famous architect, and he refused to show up for the opening of this hotel that he really did design. He just invested himself into other projects, of which there were a lot at the time, including that hotel that was, like, the rival hotel. But it turns out that was just going to be temporary. Wow. They put it next to a section of railroad that was being built, but once the railroad was built, that wasn't going to be a stop. So that hotel got built, and then eventually, like, it just became nothing. So what's funny is the story I just told you actually comes from a biography about rats, and that is literally called The Life and Tragic End of British Columbia's Greatest Architect. Wow. So he's very well, widely known today, at least in the architectural community in British Columbia. That's crazy. But The Life and Tragic End has a little bit of spoilers in it. What's and the I tragic end? And I think you end? know where I'm going Did with that. Did he kill that. himself in the building? No, no, no. Ghosts. So we're going to get to the ghosts here for a little while, and then I'm going to tell you about the most famous ghost. I bet you can guess who it is at this point. Rats. So were all the delays that happened to the Empress Hotel rats' fault? Probably not. Shit happens when it comes to construction. Sometimes your materials don't arrive. Sometimes cough, you have to change. Cough, Raider Stadium. Right? Sometimes you have to change the schedule to just try and complete the stuff that you can. And there were rumors that during construction... One of the carpenters working on the project hung himself what? in an unspecified location in the building while it was being built. Oh, man. And I imagine that would cause a delay as well. But like I said, I can't confirm anything on that myself. So the hotel opens up January 20th, 1908. And all I can say is if I were opening up my own hotel, I would be hoping we could be open for as long as possible without some sort of weird tragic death you know what i mean yeah i feel like so many hotels especially the ones we talk about very quickly turn into this like media piece Murder hotel. where some exactly where something happens and then all of a sudden you're labeled with that and if the empress were my hotel i would have been really disappointed only a year into it being open because at this point i will note that the following could be bullshit but it, it's stated pretty much universally across the board when you research the hotel uh, I wasn't able to locate any official like death certificate information for this next one, but it's all over there. So, 1909, the next year after the hotel opens, a chambermaid named Lizzie McGrath was going about her chambermaidenly duties uh, on the sixth floor of the Empress, which is important because during this time, she, for some reason, was working in a room and needed to exit onto the fire escape. And there were a couple issues with her exiting onto that fire escape. The first was that Lizzie apparently was not in the loop on recent developments with the hotel. There was construction currently going on, which sucks because they just opened the place a year ago. So maybe they were fixing something that was broken. She stepped out this window and her foot landed where the fire escape had been prior to recent construction. Oh my gosh. Which for whatever reason was taken down during the construction. So there was no fire escape. The other issue with Lizzie stepping out that window is she apparently didn't check to see if there was actually anything there before stepping out, because there wasn't. And the final issue is that Lizzie could not fly. So she plummeted oh my God. six stories to her death. Do you think she death. did it on purpose, though? They don't think so. They think it was strictly an accident. So not long after her death, guests reported seeing a chambermaid diligently cleaning on the sixth floor of the hotel at odd times that fit Lizzie's description. And when I hear that, I think, you know, they probably thought at the time, it's probably just a different cleaning lady or a different chambermaid with the same outfit. But people still see her. Long after the outfits have changed, yeah. they still see a lady that fits Lizzie's description cleaning diligently on the sixth floor of this hotel. Do you think they hired someone to do it? When I thought about it, I thought that could be my skeptical brain. And then I kind of looked at the hotel and all the advertising for the hotel today. And it's like... There's nothing in there about it being haunted at all. So they don't want to. Just the stories. Okay. Yeah. It's not something that they hang their hat on at all, nor do they need to, because this place really is beautiful, and there'll be pictures of it on our Instagram. Oh, I, I can't wait to see it. It's really nice. Like, I was going through it, and I was just, like, clicking through. I was like, damn, I wish this wasn't Vegas. Also, in 1909, during this construction, there were multiple sightings by workers that they saw a shadowy figure swinging from the ceiling, and it turns out it was the same location that the carpenter had hung himself 
during construction of the hotel. But it's undisclosed. How do they know? They knew where it had happened. But, like, they don't keep records of where this guy hung himself in the hotel, so people won't go looking for it. But those reports were coming out, so now we have two ghosts in a year, basically. And residents over the years have repeatedly reported seeing an old lady roaming the hallways of the Empress, dressed in her jam jams. So, what kind of jam jams? I don't know. It's not very specific. Like a muumuu? I would imagine like a nice nightgown, like a, just a classy thing for an old lady to wear, but she's wandering around the hallways of the hotel, and this one doesn't have a specific origin or a person's name. It's just something that people see. She's apparently looking for her own hotel room and even knocks on the doors of other rooms. That's creepy. That's the creepiest part of this one. She knocks on the doors of other people's rooms, lets them know she can't find her room, and people, because she's old, try and help her find her room. And as they're walking around with her, she's very nice, but once they reach the elevators, she disappears, which is super fucking creepy. Yeah. There's speculation that during one of the many renovations that this hotel has undergone in the time... That where the hotel shafts are now used to be rooms, and it must be the room that she used to be in, possibly died in. Maybe. That's kind of the legend taking on a life of its own, but this is supposed to be the location where... It would be easy to check that, though. Yeah. With blueprint records. I'm not going and looking up, like, a hall of records or anything like that, because I don't have access to it from this laptop. I might be able to do it if I was, like, on the ground and had some money, because I think you have to request those sorts of records. On the ground, okay. So, yeah. Maybe give us a TV show and send me, and I'll try and figure out what I can. Wow. But she disappears, and it's super fucking creepy. But that's not the main attraction, obviously. I've kind of already hinted at it. The main attraction goes back to old rats, and this next part is a true story. I can let you know that almost everything I'm about to tell you is 100% a legit. So I mentioned that Rats was kind of an asshole, right? You were saying. So we're going to get into some more of his life, and then you can evaluate what kind of person that you think he is. So this is pretty true to form for him, even outside of his work, that he wasn't exactly the nicest guy. Because you think maybe he was an asshole at work, but when he left work, maybe he was a good dude. Like the guy who's in charge of the hospital in Scrubs, whose name I can't remember right now. So (laughs) Rats had married a woman named Florence in 1898. Her friends called her Flory, which I think is a really nice nickname. They had two kids together named Frank and Mary. When Rats reached 56 years old, he decided that the whole wife and kids thing was too boring for him. I think this is 1923. So he bailed on his family and started shacking up with a woman named Alma Packenham. I think I said that right. Alma was 27, so 30 years younger than Rats at the time. And according to witnesses at the time, she was a sexy Rexy. She was very beautiful. Okay. It is, however, unfortunate that being a home wrecker like she was, she was the type of Rexy that is classified as a Skankasaurus Rex. Oh my gosh, you totally did all this on purpose. I did. <laughs> so, wow. to make matters worse, Rats's wife, Flory, at the time when he left her, was suffering from cancer. So, as a side note, so much for the whole in sickness and in health vow. That's messed up. It's super fucking messed up. Like, so you're getting a really good picture of what he is like. Yeah. He is a rat. Yeah. It's a pretty accurate nickname. So, Rats decided that the best thing for him to do when it came to this torrid affair was to make sure everyone knew about it. So, since he was this figure, this public figure that people knew about and talked about, he started going out on the town with his mistress, making sure, like... The public knew, the press knew, pretty much everyone knew that he was cheating and had moved on. What is the point? I don't know. I think this guy was just desperate for the public's attention. And it's the same shitty behavior he had exhibited in the past when it came to seeking the spotlight, even and especially when he was making an ass of himself, like when he was fucking around and delaying the project on the Empress in the first place. So his friends and colleagues were like, I'm going to head out. And they, of course, uh, he's been talking about this meme all day. My favorite new meme. Uh, and they straight up just thought Rats' behavior was too shitty, and business and personal associates were like, fuck this dude. So, to try and sort of smooth things over, Rats did what any rational person would do at the time. He was still paying for the bills at his former home, which he was no longer staying in. That's where Flory lived. And he decided not only to stop paying the bills there, but to call and have the heating and lights disconnected to the home, leaving his still legal wife, who had cancer, in a house with no heat or electricity. Because he's just a super classy dude. Yeah, what a piece of shit. So eventually he was ostracized so thoroughly from the community of Victoria, British Columbia, that he basically had to leave town. Like, he left for like four years, 
And he came back for a brief stint before moving away again. Where'd he go? So he, okay, I'll get there. So in 1925, Flory finally agreed to give him the divorce and cut the turd free. Like sometimes you just have to flush the turd no matter how attached you are to it. So once she... You don't do it every time? (laughs) Rats and Alma married in 1927. So he marries his mistress and they would have a son named John in 1929. Uh, Flory, Rats' ex-wife, would pass away in 1929 from cancer. She was 50 years old at the time when she passed away. And while all of that information about Rats is interesting, it's not the real story here. The real story takes place after Rats and Alma decided to move in 1929 and they went all the way across the world to Bournemouth, England. And this was five years later after they moved. So 1929 they moved. We're going to fast forward to 1934 because... After only five years, cracks began to form in this story tale marriage that they had. And it turns out Alma wasn't exactly the best of people. Shocker. Uh, Rat's behavior and basically professional suicide wound up having some serious side effects on his life. So he went from being this amazing architect that was paid attention to because of his creations to sort of just an afterthought. Like, what happened to that guy? He's no longer around. Do you remember how he left in, like, shame and misery? Uh, and that sort of happens when you burn all of your bridges and you relocate 5,000 miles away, which he straight up did. Dilly dilly. Uh, so because of his lack of work, he was having serious money flow problems. He had basically nothing coming in. And Alma at this point was in her mid thirties and she started to stray from her beloved husband because, you know, if the money's not coming in, she's not interested apparently. And a man named George Percy Stoner had caught her eye. He was their chauffeur. What? He was 17 at the time. Oh, my. He caught her eye. So She was a cougar. So here's the thing. Okay, you have Rats, who's like 65, I think, at the time. And then you have his wife, who's 34. And then you have the guy that she's paying attention to, that she's telling him not to worry about, who's 17 years old. And apparently Rats wasn't around a lot because Alma requested that Stoner chauffeur her to Pound Town on the fuck truck. And as a side oh note, gosh. so much for that whole for richer or poorer vow because she clearly had never been a big fan of vows. And of course, she started to have an affair with Stoner. And apparently prior to being Alma's mistress, this dude had lived a very sheltered life. He lived with his parents up until he was vi- invited to stay in the guest room of Rats' home, his new place in Bournemouth. So basically, like, he starts banging Alma, and then it's going so well, she's like, you should just live here. Wow. Like, you should live with us. You're our chauffeur. It won't seem that weird. And then you're, like, right there. They say that he basically had no friends but his parents before he met Aww. her. So it's not surprising that when the Skankasaurus Rex took him into her bed, he fell very hard for her. Yeah. And Rats, at the time that this is about to take place, I believe this is 19... 19- 35 he was 67 years old he was nearly deaf he had next to no money left and he was drinking a lot because apparently alcoholism was a big thing with him too yeah so he often spoke uh out loud about ending his own life but he never went through with it it really sounds like that traditional attention seeking behavior and not actual suicidal behavior Did his wife tell him to go do it no she didn't tell him that she was basically not paying attention to him some folks even think he was aware that the 18-year-old chauffeur was banging his wife, but turned a blind eye to it because his life was already in ruins. Wait, and so he was 17 and now he's 18. He's 18. This is a year later. Okay. Correct. So Stoner, though, he hated rats. He hated his guts. Who and likes rats? I can't say rats I feel sorry for rats, you know, because, like, I think that I would hate rats, too. Um, wait, you just made a joke about him not liking the animal known as rats? Yeah. I hate you so much. The rats are cute. So, anyways... Uh, he hates the man known as Rats, who's basically just been this like top-notch asshole through his whole life at best, and an absolute monster at his worst. I will say, though, Stoner's hate sincerely seemed to come from a place of jealousy specifically. It has nothing to do with all his past deeds. It's simply because... He's married to the chick that he's, he's in love with. He's married to the chick he's in love with, okay. precisely. So March 24th, 1935 hits, and things a get real. So Rats decided to sit down with Alma, his wife and talk to her. They've been married for, I think at this point, about 10 years. And they address the current state of their finances and their marriage in particular, her unfaithfulness. And it wasn't like an explosive conversation. And what's bizarre is that when this was all over and this married couple finished talking about everything that they're going through and like how they are together, 
they reached a good place about their lives and then they banged it out. Like they, they talked about it. They felt better. They're like still in love with each other. It sounds like. And so they just had sex. Holy crap. And Stoner lost his shit. Basically, it was like Alma was cheating on him with her husband type of thing. You know, he confronted Alma over having sex with her own husband. And while he was screaming at her, he had a revolver pointed in her face while he did it because he's clearly become unhinged. And then around about 10 p.m., he went down to the ground level of the estate because rich people don't even go broke like poor people do. And he had a uh, construction mallet in his hand or a carpenter's mallet. And he uh, found rats in his sitting room, probably sitting. (laughs) And he used the mallet (laughs) to cave in the back of Rats' skull. Jesus. He struck him multiple times, more than enough to accomplish the task. And Rats, the architect of the Empress, was brutally murdered in his own home by his wife's lover. And in a bizarre twist of fate, he was finally headline news again. And like all high profile headline trials. Headline news. It's not that good. Like skull line news. I guess it got hit in the head. I guess it kind of works. But like all high profile trials that will ever take place ever as long as the media exists, his murder was called the trial of the century. Because if there's a big profile okay. thing and it's current, it's the trial of the century. And Alma actually confessed to the murder after a few days and was taken to jail. Stoner confessed to several of the house staff that he was actually the one who had killed rats and eventually came forward and was also arrested. And the trial, there was some bizarre shit that took place too. Alma and Stoner were charged with the murder and had separate attorneys. Now here's the thing that's interesting. When you look up the trial of the century here that's about to take place, uh, and if you Google it, you'll probably never find it. But if you Google like the correct names of the folks, you will find it. Um, it's kind of romanticized when you read like summaries of this trial where people are like, this took place, then this took place, and they kind of try and make it look like these two were still very much in love and blah, 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 blah. But when you have your own lawyers, I mean. Things take a turn here. And this is stuff that actually happened. So uh, Alma wound up getting visited by her eldest son while she was in jail. And after his visit, she recanted her confession. And I'm sorry, I know I'm not a professional when it comes to the law, but I'm pretty sure there should be a law in place called no takesy backsies when it comes to murder confessions that far after the fact. And when this happened, it became a lot of finger pointing. And even though people will try and claim like, oh, they are still so much in love. Alma did claim that she had an affair. She admitted to that. But that Stoner had basically turned batshit crazy with jealousy. And he had also developed a cocaine addiction, which apparently helped fuel his rage. And she claimed that her connection that still remained with her husband and Stoner's inability to possess her completely led to him murdering her husband. Like, she didn't have anything to do with it. It's not on her. So Stoner, on the other hand, he leaned into the whole, I was totally fine until I met this bitch defense. And his lawyers painted a picture of a quiet, good, upstanding young man being seduced by an evil older woman woman to fill her loneliness. And, like, the reports all kind of tend to lean towards she's the one that totally initiated the relationship. She's the one that had all the control in the relationship. And so he really leaned into that. So once he fell in love with her, basically the defense they were going for is she manipulated him and used him for everything she wanted, which eventually led to her pressuring him to, like, free her from her marriage. And in the end, those two, like, defenses were presented and the jury acquitted Alma of murder and accessory to murder. Wow. She got off scot-free. Stoner was found guilty of the murder of Francis Rats Rattenberry, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. Do you think when he was standing there getting hung, well, about to get hanged, he was just like, oh, rats. No, I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. (gasps) When he was found guilty, Alma collapsed in the courtroom. Like, oh, no, I can't believe they're going to kill him. So... She got off scot-free, and then she was upset that he was going to be hung. And three days after the end of the trial, Alma took her own life. Wow. She killed herself. And uh, what's kind of fascinating to me is she stabbed herself with a dagger in the heart six times and then threw her own body into a river. So she was murdered. It sounds to me definitely a lot like murder. And, like, there's different ways that this is written. 
where she stood on the shores of the River Avon and stabbed herself six times in her heart and then collapsed into the river. But a lot of the stuff around the time that I can find yeah, she's really murdered. makes it sound like someone stabbed her to death and then threw her in the fucking river. But who knows? I don't. You can't stab yourself in the heart six freaking times. I was going to say, like, at some point, like, you're just going to hit the, like, killing blow and then fall. But maybe it took her six times to get there because, like, your breastplate is pretty strong, I'm pretty sure. So, I mean, I've watched Pulp Fiction. They oh tell them they gosh. have to bring it down really hard. So, I don't think you've seen Pulp Fiction, actually. Um, anyways, a little after Alma dies, Stoner's death sentence was rescinded and he was instead sentenced to life imprisonment. And several publications that I read stated that the public sympathy to Alma's death and this tragic love story of her being in love with this young boy was the reason that they, like, made his death sentence go away. But nothing could be further from the truth because it probably had more to do with a petition that was signed by over 300,000 people that believed that Alma had manipulated him into killing her husband And it wasn't his fault in the first place. And this was actually something that existed that was actually delivered to the person in charge of his sentencing. So they reversed it to life imprisonment where he would just stay in prison for the rest of his life. So you probably wonder, did he rot in prison? He was sentenced in 1935. And no, he did not. Because a little thing called World War II happened. Oh, wow. So in 1942, they released Stoner. On the condition he would fight for the Allied forces in the war, he survived World War II. He married in 1944 and had a daughter in 1948. He lived his life relatively quietly after that, although in 1990, he actually ran afoul of the law again while he was 72 years old. What did he do? He was caught sexually assaulting a 12-year-old boy in a bathroom, which is bizarre. And some of the folks actually, like... Showed up to say, like, he has fucking Alzheimer's. Like, this dude's brain is mush. Know a lot of people with Alzheimer's in my life. It's very sad. Don't know any of them that turned into a child rapist. Yeah. So, he was put on two years probation. He wound up dying. He won- I know, right? He wound up dying in the year 2000 at the age of 83. So, all three folks that were involved in this love triangle, now you know what happened with them. Now you know their end. And Rats? Well, shortly after Rats' death, he started being seen wandering the halls of the Empress Hotel. Wow. So it's another thing where I get kind of skeptical, like, why would your spirit teleport back to this specific spot, especially when it's not the most well-known spot, because that Parliament building is incredible. But I think it's because it was his most public failure. I was about to say that. It's like you want to go back to what you thought about most in your life where... Your unfinished business. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Unfinished business. That sounds good. And they see the older version of rats, too. They see, like, the old man version. They see him walking around with a cane. It's a walking cane. And folks state that he wanders the hotel and that he's just hoping to hear praise for his work about the hotel itself. And you'd think if his ghost was there, he would have been put to rest, actually, in 1981 because the Empress in 1981 was officially declared a historic site of Canada. So it's very much well regarded as this amazing building that's very rich in the history of British Columbia and Canada as a whole. And even that apparently didn't put him to rest, though, because he's still said to wander the grounds. And one of the sites I saw said that if you do see him, be nice and say something nice about the hotel. Like, be the Canadian way where you're just very polite because it might finally put him to rest. And I suppose that couldn't hurt but he was kind of a huge piece of shit in his life. So it's kind of like, why would I be nice to this dude who's not at rest because he was a piece of garbage? Although his end kind of like built up from his life. You know what I mean? Like, right. it's like he was writing this check his whole life that his like murder wound up cashing. Yeah. Like basically karma got to him. Like yeah. sooner or later, all the terrible deeds that you put into your life is going to come back to you. Now, one thing I will say about the Empress Hotel, and I already mentioned it, is that this place is really nice like really friggin nice this website doesn't have anything on it about their ghost stories or any reference to a ghost you tour gotta show me pictures. or anything like that there's gonna be pictures on their instagram too and it's like there's wedding pictures of all the people that have their weddings there and photos of the grounds it's huge and it brags about how nice it is it doesn't do that whole like one of the most haunted hotels in the world that every other haunted hotel we've ever covered has on their website It has, like, we're in the top 21 iconic hotels in the world on their front page. Or, like, 
Nat Geo puts us in the top 10 city hotels in all of Canada. Like that's the sort the sort of things that they advertise. So if you're Nat Geo covers those things. Nat Geo covers stuff that's like on the globe. So huh. it's like ranking very nice, very beautiful places to go. And it's just pretty awesome. Like when I saw this, I was like, yeah, we could probably make this a Patreon goal one day. Yeah. Or if we're ever in Victoria, we're definitely going to stop by this place. I have friends in Canada. I would love to stay the night. It's not that crazy expensive. I checked for 2020 days, like January, middle of January, end of February type of thing. $200. Where it's like off season. That's the 250 I'm pretty sure if you look like on peak hotel days, like around weekends where people are going to be staying there, it's probably going to be close to like 400 bucks, maybe yeah. even more per night. Uh, but it is really, really friggin' nice. And, like, the skeptic in me likes that. We should set a Patreon goal so we can go. We're going to have to pick what number it'll be, but I'm sure we can figure it's something gotta out. got to be, like, 300, 500 or something. I was thinking 300, but we'll see what happens with it. And, honestly, like, this would be much different because this isn't the sort of place that really leans on its haunted heritage. It would basically be like we're setting a Patreon goal for you folks to pay for a nice vacation of ours to a place that's supposedly haunted. Because this is the nice haunted location I've ever researched. Like, hands down. It's a gorgeous hotel. Straight up. So, I think it's really interesting that the person who designed the hotel is the most famous ghost. And he had this super high profile, 100% true murder. So, very interesting stuff. But that's everything I could dig up on the Empress Hotel. Nice. I'm really excited to go one day. One day. So anyone who actually listens to us from Canada or the like area in the United States that borders Canada that close, let us know if you've ever been there or anyone who's ever been there for that matter or ever seen it because I am very interested to know what it's like in person. Uh, but yeah, that's everything that I think that I have for my topic. Cool. So a uh, quick reminder to all the folks that like to send us your stories, email storytimeiscarish.com and check them out on Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is... 8.30 Central and 9.30 Eastern if you want to watch us record it live. Otherwise, those episodes come out every Friday and you can hear your story be read. And uh, we appreciate everyone that gets sent in to us. And Robin, for the folks who wanted to donate to us, how can they do so? You guys can go on over to patreon.com slash podcast and those are monthly donations. Tiers start at a dollar. I'm really excited because we just released our fall design and it is so cute. You guys can check it out on Patreon, teespring.com. Um, it's on our Facebook page. It's I, pretty exciting when we put up a new design and a bunch of and like... Ho- I love it. It's my favorite. It's the first one I've ever done where I printed front and back. So it's going to be super cute. I'm really excited. Uh, it's also the first design that I've printed on the sleeve. So You're talking about for the merch, right? For the merch. Yeah. So yeah. it's really cool when we put up new merch for our new designs and we see sales happening like immediately yeah it's very exciting like, we oh, feel so touched that folks actually like our stuff i know uh, it's super it's, awesome you guys we can't we could not do this without you we, we really couldn't um being able to keep this up like i just started school and trying to keep up with scheduling and making time and doing the podcast like we and, love being there every single week for you guys yeah, and y'all don't tell anyone but i totally got a promotion at work so it's been a lot of hard work there too so yeah so yeah, we're happy that you guys like us and uh, patreon.com slash scariest podcast. Those are monthly donations. If you go to coffee.com, ko-fi.com slash scariest podcast, those are one-time donations and all those donations help us upgrade our studio setup. The computer is finally going to be built and I'm super excited to have a, I won't say not reliable because Asus Republic of Gamer laptop, you've carried me so far, but like a redundancy and something that's built like specifically in mind piece by piece with the idea that we're going to be producing stuff like we produce now, like the live show and the like episodes like every single week. So it is all because of the fact that folks like you go to coffee or folks like you watch us live and give us those donations because we can slowly accrue the funds that we need to get the components that I needed to build this thing. And buy yourself some scariest merch because that helps you guys can rep us out there i i ordered ourselves a hoodie i well, i ordered myself a hoodie and a i got t-shirt. a mug i'm super got a excited mug. uh and we're super excited to have our own merch <laughs> but um we're just very excited to have you guys on this adventure with us so thank you so much thank you indeed and i think that's just about everything that we have for this episode so robin sign us out keep on creeping on and we'll talk to you guys later Bye-bye.